It's going to be a great day, and I do believe the Lord has put a word on my heart for you. And lucky for you, I've got to practice this word repeatedly, so I'm kind of a pro on this topic. But first of all, I want to honor my pastors and my leaders, Pastor Charlotte and Wayne. These guys are almost undescribable. I've put down a whole list of words. Amazing, incredible, loving, honest, vulnerable, caring, hands-on, hilarious. He is. <laughs> he puts his hand up and Pastor Charlotte goes like this. <laughs> no, they really are. They're the real deal. I get to, I'm privileged to see them in different ways than most people do, and I don't take that lightly, but they absolutely walk what they preach. They're the real, real deal, and I know personally because they have walked with me and my family through the high highs and the super low lows. And I'm so thankful that when I pick up the phone, they're on the other end. And I have several times picked up the phone and they have been on the other end and chosen to get nitty gritty with me through my mess and my muck. And that's my leaders. I'm thankful. And you know what is so cool is I get to do kingdom work with them. And that really is living the dream. And do you know what is also dreamy? This little poofy thing. It's a chin rest. Oh my goodness. It feels so good. My chin's taking a nap on the mic. My gosh. This is awesome. Okay, now a little bit of an introduction about me because you guys see Worship Leader. And you know what? I was shocked when I was building a friendship with this one person. She was completely shocked that I listened to anything but worship music. <gasps> I do have other likes other than worship music. And you know, sometimes the, the waters get a little bit muddy for me and I do need to listen to something other than what I'm preparing. But I do like U2, Coldplay. I really love John Mayer for his guitar skills, not for his morals, okay? Um, he's a phenomenal musician and probably the dream would be John Mayer, Bono, and Coldplay leading worship getting saved and leading worship. You know, we all have our dreams. I think it would be awesome. Um, my name is Melody. You can call me Bishop, Apostle, <laughs> whatever. I'm not about titles, but you can just choose any of those. I'll be fine with that. My favorite color is green. My favorite song is by Dolly Parton. Caffeine, 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 caffeine. That's how it goes, right? For me, that's how it goes, unfortunately. Uh, I'm a baker, I'm a cook. I love creating in the kitchen, and it works almost all the time, except for the time I went really crazy with those Plan Ahead freezer Ziploc meals. You can ask my family about that. I'm too ashamed to even share the story. I have many likes and hobbies outside of music. I've discovered that I'm a crafty person. I denied it for years and years because I thought crafty people were weird. Sorry, all the crafty people. I'm one of you. I am. Um, I like to try new things. And by try new things, I mean I'm going to invest heavily in all the most expensive supplies for that new thing. I'm going to make a few of them, and then I'm going to move on to the next new thing. Pray for my husband. <laughs> I'm a runner, I'm passionate about clean eating, and I'm passionate about good eating. So I will go for a run and then I will make brownies and I am not one bit ashamed of it. I'm a purist when it comes to baking and cooking. If it's not butter, it's... Sorry, that's just me. I love homemaking. That's one of my passions. I love creating a space where people feel welcome and loved. I like them to come into my home and feel the presence of God. I like them to come home for my family and for others and feel like it's an oasis. I love doing that. I love hiking, I love mountains, I love trees. Are you learning anything about me? My favorite color is green. I hate swimming pools. Jeremy, man. If you see me at a swimming pool, it's, gonna, it's so rare. Kelly does all the swimming pool trips with the kids. And if I'm there, you will probably laugh because I will walk on my tippy toes the entire time. I hate the feel and the knowing of all the stuff. 
you're, you're just getting to know me. There's so much more to me and maybe a little more dysfunction than the powerful worship leader here. When you're standing in that office, you get to see that. I'm so glad you get to see that and maybe not all the other. Okay, food. I love food. Favorite food, the taco. Can I get an amen? This is going to be interactive. And this is super spiritual, guys. Come on. Get your hearts in the right place. The taco. Can I get an amen? Okay, good. If I have to go from Mexican, I'm going to go Indian because curry. Can I get another amen? Yes. I love food. <laughs> I'm already getting hungry, man. Uh, okay, I'm married to the man, Kelly Lesmeister. Not only is he the best looking guy in the world, he is kind, funny, did I say good looking already? Very good looking. He fixes everything. Stuff that everybody else would throw in the trash, he's like, no, I can fix that. And now I just, I bring him all the stuff. He's like, oh, I got that, babe. I'm like, I know you do. He is my best friend my adventure partner, he calls out the adventure in me. He makes me take risks I never would. He'll try any food, he'll jump off any cliff, and he pushes me to, to do it. So we jump off cliffs and jump off waterfalls together and terrifies me, but it's wonderful. We've been married almost 17 years. We have three awesome girls. They are beautiful, kind, smart, hilarious. I love them. I look at them and have to pinch myself because there's so much to them that I don't know how they got. Have you ever looked at your kids and you're like, I could never do that. How can you do that? So I have one conclusion, Kelly plus me equals genius. <laughs> we homeschool our kids and we actually enjoy it. We love being around our kids 90%, 80, 85. It's on the other side of 50, so I think we're doing, it's on the higher, it's a higher end. Some days higher than others, but we love them. We live a simple life. As a family, we have discovered what's important, and turns out it's not the stuff. It's not the cars, the trucks, the houses, the possessions, all of the stuff, we have learned the presence of God is the greatest prize. As a family, we've learned that the presence of God is the reward in this life. And it hasn't come easy, it's actually come through a process, and if I think about it, the areas of our greatest pain have been the places that we've grown the most. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Are you excited? Yeah. Pain. Bring on the pain. Come on, 2 Corinthians 4.17 says this. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Look to your neighbor and ask him this question. You ready for this? Is your pain working for you? I'm going to explain as we go along, but I asked my husband this last night, and he's like, no. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's, not, no, that's not the answer I wanted, because I want you to get this scripture, the pain is working for me something. So the correct answer was, yes, my pain is working for me in good things, but we're going to get there. Joshua 3 and 4. We're gonna take our whole teaching, preaching, whatever you wanna call it today, from this amazing story. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of backstory and then we're gonna pick up kind of in the middle. In Joshua 3 and 4, we read the story of the Israelites in the wilderness. And they have taken the long way to get to the promised land. 40 years, man. Let that sink in. You think you're you know, late or waiting on the promise, they wandered 40 years. But Moses dies now, and Joshua is the leader. They do the whole mourning thing for their leader, and then God says something super amazing. Joshua, Moses is dead. Time to be the leader. 
So Joshua steps up and the first thing God says is it's time to go into that promised land. And the reason this word is so significant for this timing is because I feel like we're at this crossing over moment, maybe in our lives, but even as a church, we kind of start things up again in the fall and we do this kickoff and we have the big barbecue next week. And I just thought, this is kind of perfect timing for this. So Moses is dead, it's time to move. The first thing you're gonna do is go into the promised land, but there's a problem. The Jordan is blocking the way. And it's not only blocking the way, it is raging. Like it is flood season, it's coming up over the banks, but the Lord says this, I'm gonna dry it out before you, you're gonna walk through and it's gonna be wonderful. So here's the instructions he gives. He says, I want the priests to carry the Ark of the Covenant, so if you are not familiar with that term, the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament is symbolic of the presence of God. It was their symbol of, this is our Lord, this is his presence. So God says, the priests are gonna carry the Ark of the Covenant, and as soon as their feet touch the waters, I'm gonna dry it up down here, the waters are gonna pile up, the Ark is gonna go into the middle of the, the river, and all the Israelites are gonna pass through on dry ground, then the Ark will come up and it'll be fine and dandy. Miraculous, right? Wonderful. So I want to read to you, kind of in the middle of this process, in Joshua 4, it's a little bit long, but stay with me. This is the story, and then we're going to pull pieces out of it. Joshua 4, 1 to 11, read along on your phone or your paper Bibles. And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them. Take for yourselves 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Verse 4. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on your shoulder according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Verse eight, and the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded, they took 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. So the priests who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded. And Joshua, till everything had finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, the people hurried and crossed over and it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over, the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in the presence of the people. So today we're gonna to talk about the pain, the process and the outcome. And we're gonna label it from our text. The river is the pain, the crossing over is the process, and the other side, the outcome is the memorial. So talking about pain, we're gonna to have to set up a few non-negotiables, and I already know this is gonna rub you the wrong way, because it did me, but we must have this foundation set up. We must know who God is and who God isn't before we can deal with the topic of pain. So number one, God does not cause pain. Your feathers ruffled already? And God does not use pain as punishment. Now let me clarify this. Pain is inevitable. You will go through pain in your life, but that is not God's character. So God is redemptive in his nature that he will use anything, but he will not break your arm so he can show you his mercy that is twisted, and that is not how our God functions. The thief comes, we know this passage, to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life, and life abundantly. 
God is not the author of pain. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. God's announcement of Jesus is a really good baseline for God's nature. Goodwill to men, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Jesus' motto. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So follow me on this trail for a minute and then we're gonna get into the pain. I want you to think about this differently. Because I've been working through this in my own pain. Pain is a result of sin. It really is. Think about it. Somebody's either caught in some sort of sin, causing themselves pain and other people pain, or you're on the receiving end of that pain. I'm not talking about like a stubbed my toe kind of pain. Although, why are there so many nerves in our feet? And why does your baby toe seem to be like enlarged? You hit it once and then it's like a magnet for every corner and every piece of furniture in your house. Point to ponder. And why is it that you stub your toe when you're already angry? <sighs> okay, I'm not talking about that kind of pain. <laughs> What's crazy is I'm not even talking about the kind of pain, maybe you hear some news you don't want to hear, you get a diagnosis for some sort of illness or sickness. I'm not even talking about the pain of that illness. I'm talking about the underneath pain of I'm so disappointed with that. Or somebody lets you down and there's that under, under the surface kind of pain. That's the kind of pain that we're talking about today. Okay? If we really believe that God is good, that he is love, it's not just what he does, it's who he is, we have to view pain through that filter of, okay, God, you didn't cause it, but I'm surrendering it to you to use it. So the first thing was, is your pain working for you? These light and momentary afflictions are working for you. An exceeding weight of glory that can't be compared to anything else. Here's the problem with pain, though. If we don't experience it, we're not going to grow. And if we do experience it, it too often becomes the filter we view everything through. Unhealed pain becomes pain expressed. Promise you. And unfortunately, it's usually to those closest to us because we could put on a real nice face for everybody around us. But then when we really are with the ones that are, get the real deal us, that pain will be shown. <laughs> Here's a wonderful, wonderful quote by Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. How's that for an inspirational quote? <laughs> Let's leave that one up there. Thank you, Lord. Wow, all your promises are yes and no. Oh, darn. <laughs> Except maybe not that one. I don't want that one. But his comfort on the other side of that is he's been through it all. He's overcome the world and you too will overcome. So our foundation has to be on this, the goodness of God. If we spend time digging, digging into the word, getting to know his nature, we are more ready to invite him into those painful things than we are to blame him for them. Okay? Do we have a good enough foundation? Let's start with the river, the pain. Oh, yeah. Now, before you think, what could Mel possibly have to talk about in regard to pain. Did your husband not take out the garbage yesterday? You poor thing. Oh, did your kids throw a fit in safe way today and embarrass you? That has happened. <laughs> That's not the pain. So I'm gonna graze over a few things and I'm gonna graze over them quickly because my focus today is not the pain or the trauma or anything. It is what God can do through them. But I'm just going to give you a pain resume just to build up some credibility, okay? It's going to get better, I promise. Why does Mel have the mic? I once lived with such crippling fear and anxiety that I would take sleeping pills a week before I would lead and a week after 
I was terrified of not being good enough, and I would analyze in my brain every word I said, every conversation I had, every song I sang until I almost went mad. It got to the point where I was having panic attacks. For anybody who's had a panic attack, that's the real deal. Like, you actually think you're going to die. It's terrifying. I've had two miscarriages. I've laid down dreams, hopes, and desires. Had a few go-arounds with depression and even suicidal thoughts. Yes, me. We as a family have walked through betrayals of many kinds, addictions, job loss. We've lived in big houses with lots, and we've lived in little houses with very, very little. My husband and I, and I even were separated for a season and didn't know if our marriage would be restored, if our family would ever be back together again. Yes, me. There were times in my life I felt so lonely that I just wanted Jesus to take me home. Like, man, I don't have a friend but you, so let's just be together now. There were times when I felt so betrayed. The only way I can describe it is that the floor fell out from underneath me, and I was alone and dark. There was nobody else there. There were times when I felt like my song was robbed from me, and how could I get up and sing this because I was so broken? I know pain. Here's what I learned, though. You have to decide where you're going to go. And if you decide ahead of time, it makes it just a little bit easier. It's not easy to go there in your pain, but if you decide ahead of time, I'm going to go to the Lord. Whatever I face, whatever feelings, circumstances I face, I will go to the Lord. Psalm 73 28 says this, I have made the Lord my refuge and placed my trust in him that I may tell of your works. Look at that determination. I have made the Lord my refuge. Predecided in my heart, he's my refuge. Isn't that amazing? I worked at a senior's home in my early teens and I remember being shocked even at an early age how pain could be worn on a face and expressed in body language. I could just envision in some of these people that 50-year-old grudge, that trauma that was never healed. You know, what must have happened to you to make you the way you are today? And I remember even thinking as like a 14, 15-year-old girl, man, I never want to be that harsh. Not even really knowing that it could happen so, so easily. I wonder what the river was that they were facing that they were too scared to go into and cross. I wonder what it was. Pain that isn't transformed is transmitted. Pain will either produce good or bad for you. So make pain work for you, not the other way around. Psalm 84, verse 5 to 7 says this. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of weeping, they make it a place of springs, and they go from strength to strength. I love how he says, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. So he was used to going to the Lord. I've already decided, I have paved a giant freeway in my heart and my mind that leads right to you, Lord. So this is the, the pain, the facing the pain. I've decided I'm gonna go to the Lord. I wanna share two responses to painful life detours that I see, and I can, I can say it because last week, I wanted to do them both. And I was so upset that the Lord got me to test out my sermon a few days before I was gonna preach it. <laughs> Like, no, I know all this already, God, eh, let's just see if you really believe it. So two things that I see, one is muscle through, the other one is lay down. Now muscle through sounds really great, and it's what all of us, you know, powerful warrior spiritual people do. We get hurt and we put the, the rock in the backpack and we keep going. We keep going, we keep packing it on. Somebody says something, oh, that hurt. No, put it in there. 
just keep carrying around a lifetime of pain. We do it. There's so much in my backpack, and it's heavy, but I'm going to muscle through. The other thing we do is we lay down, and this one sounds really weak, but I wanted to do it this week because I was just tired. I don't want to deal with that. I don't even want to feel that. So I'm going to lay down, and it's kind of like you make a little pillow out of your pain, and you just lay there, kind of self-soothe a little bit. Maybe you, you lean into a... Uh, self-soothing Netflix binge or whatever it is. I'm just going to lay here, make a bed for my pain, and cuddle it, and this is where I'm staying. The problem is, is the pain never leaves. You're either packing it around or you're cuddling it. <laughs> so there's a process you have to go through. Now, ladies that have given birth in the room, I'm going to ask you a question. Does it matter? C-section, natural, doesn't matter. It all hurts. Um, would you rather two days of contractions that get more and more painful, but at the end of it, you got that baby, and he or she is healthy, and you're, you're done with the pain? Or would you rather have medium contractions and an extra 80 pounds for the rest of your life? Come on, I don't like pain, but I know what my answer is. Give me the hardest contractions and then zap that baby weight off in Jesus' name. I would much rather go through the pain than carry the pain for a lifetime. So let's go back to our text in Joshua. Look how the Lord instructs him. What's the first thing to touch the waters? Anybody? the ark, the priest's feet, the presence of God. Just like the presence of God broke the flow of the waters for the Israelites to pass through, his presence is ahead of you, inviting you to walk through any and all places of pain. That's your guarantee today. Even if the, the river is raging in front of you, impossible looking, pre-decide. If the Lord says it's time, I'm going. Joshua decided ahead of time that what God said was true, and he was going to obey him. So Joshua was pretty gutsy, but he obeyed him. So pain, decide where you're going to go, acknowledge it. By the way, it's pointless to deny it, and it's pointless to try to bypass the feelings. Feelings get a really bad rap, but let me tell you, when you take your feelings to the Lord, he actually heals you in that. And you can go through the whole crazy roller coaster of I'm mad, I'm mad, I'm mad, I'm, I'm so sad. And he's there through it all. But you need to do that with the Lord. Probably not, depending on the severity, probably not your well intentioned friends that are just going to pat you on the back. Okay, let's go to the process the crossing over. Okay? Isaiah 43 2 says this when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Isn't that beautiful? When you pass through. This is a promise, but it's also hopeful. So you're going to pass through, but I'm gonna be with you. Psalm 66 12 says, We went through fire and through water, yet you brought us out into a place of abundance to be refreshed. The Israelites walked through a place of absolute impossibility. The presence of God in the ark stayed right in the middle until everyone was across. Then the priest brought the ark over. As the last priest's foot stepped out of the river, then the water rushed in. So where is the Lord in your pain? Where is his presence in your difficulties? Where is he when you are here and you want to be healed? Where is he? He is the first one in and the last one out, I promise you. The priest's foot was the first one there. He didn't ask him to like start swimming in this crazy river. A couple of you are going to float down, but then after that, once you've shown me your faith by jumping in that river, then I'll dry it up. No, the presence of God went first. 
So the Lord in your pain, whatever you need to face, he's going to be the first one in, and he's in it with you all the way. I'm convinced that he who begun a good work in you will continue to perfect it and complete it. Now, let me look at something super interesting, because the process, it's a word we don't even really like. I am here, and I want to be there. All this junk in the middle can take a hike. The problem is, if you don't go through the process, you're probably not going to be able to even stand over there. Remember that our first scripture? Your pain is working in you, an exceeding weight of glory. So the, the pain in that scripture is pressure. And then the, the weight of the glory is also pressure, but it's a different kind of pressure. So it's almost like the pain is building up your muscles to carry the pressure of something greater on the other side. I love that. Okay, in the process, let me read two super cool things about this passage that maybe get lost in the reading because the miracle is so great, the drying of the waters, the drying up. Like, I would have gone with rubber boots, honestly. I would have been okay if it was muddy. But do you know what that speaks to me even? It's so tender. What that speaks to me that the, the land was actually dry that they could walk through? God cares. He really, really cares. Like, he could have just been like, okay, hike up your little nighty things and truck on through. It's going to be muddy, but gosh, you're getting through the river. Awesome. No, dry ground. Come on. Okay, that's not the two cool things. The two cool things are what Joshua does in the process. So we read in the first passage that he gets 12 guys to go out to where the priests are standing, grab a rock, and take it over, right? Keep that in your mind. That's the first thing. But the second thing Joshua does is so profound and amazing, and I think it's key for us this morning. Joshua himself goes out to the middle of the river where the priests are just chilling with the ark. They're just staying there until everything God said to do is done. The presence of God is there. Okay, Joshua heads back out. And what does he do? He makes his own memorial with the Lord right there in the middle of the river. Isn't that incredible? It says that in Joshua 4, 9, Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. Here's the message for us. When you let the Lord into the process, he shows you what doesn't need to cross over with you. And in his presence, he takes the stones of bitterness, unforgiveness, disappointment, trauma, betrayal, brokenness, and says, hey, let's leave those things here. They're too heavy for you to carry where we're going. So right here, in the middle of this impossible situation, the river of pain, right in the middle of that, where his presence is, let's leave some of this stuff here. And he says, remember, I didn't invite you into a process that I'm not willing to stay with you in. The crazy thing about this is these stones became a memorial that nobody would see but it was and is very symbolic for us. There is healing, refining, and load lightning that happens in the presence of God, one-on-one. -on -one. No one might have ever, no one might ever know what you leave there, but you and the Lord know, and it's very special, very special. He's in every moment and every place that you feel like you're facing pain and the process alone, he is. After Joshua had finished this hidden memorial, they cross over, the priests come up, the waters rush back in, and that little memorial that Joshua made in the presence of God in the middle of the river is it's almost seemingly nothing, right? Like the river's flowing again. But I bet you a hundred bucks it meant something to Joshua. I bet you that spot was on his radar. And I wonder what the conversation was with the Lord when he was putting those stones there. 
was it, I'm so thankful for this. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna finally step into that, that call of leadership. Yeah, I feel inadequate, but I'm gonna leave that stone or whatever it was. And I just picture him kneeling and having this moment with the Lord. And don't we all need to do that? I just pictured, I was gonna bring a backpack and fill it with 12 stones, but I'm like, I don't know where I'm gonna get 12 stones. I would just bring little pebbles and that would really be, wouldn't really seem like it would, I was gonna try to even make stones, be crafty, but lost that idea. But just picture, picture this. Maybe put yourself in the middle of that river with your backpack and you pull it off. And man, I forgot all this stuff was in here. Holy cow. No wonder it was so heavy. No wonder. And the Lord says, okay, that disappointment over that, that relationship that went to crap. Sorry, I said crap. I said it again. Let's, <laughs> let's take that stone out and put it right here in the presence of God. It's, oh, it's the mic. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> Sanctified mic. What about... What about just like bitterness? Somebody said something and it just ticked you off, but you packed it in there. Then another person, another person, another person, and you've got all this bitterness. Pretty soon, like, going to church is the worst because everybody's, everybody's the worst. And you're so bitter. Let's take that stone out. Can you picture that? What about the pain of being straight up misunderstood? Ouch. I put myself out there. Nobody, nobody really gets me, so I'm just going to close off. And the Lord says, no, no, no. Let's put that stone down here too. Whatever it is for you, it's so meaningful. It's so precious. And he's, he's willing to stay there as long as it takes, which is so incredible. This was a marker for Joshua. And then a reminder, when they're crossed over, Because I promise you, you're going to get triggered. You're going to get reminders. All oh, right, that person really ticked me off. I'm mad again. All oh, right. I remember how much that hurt. Oh, that person did this. This person said that. That person didn't notice this. That person noticed that and said, that person got the job I didn't. That person got the title I didn't. Whatever it is. And the Lord says this so tenderly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I know you used to feel that way, but remember that time in the river when we left that stone there? See, we rehash stuff way too much, and I know there's a process, and sometimes you got to you know, go back and do it again and again sometimes, but I think sometimes we just like put on the snorkel and dive in the, like we put a lot of effort into diving back into that raging river and picking those things up again. We really do, if we're honest. And the Lord says, no, that was old Mel. That stone's in the river. That's my memorial with you. Remember how I healed you in my presence that time? Remember how the load felt so much lighter after you came out? That's the reminder. This, this works with stuff like depression, panic, anger, the need for justice, bitterness, addiction, old wounds. What else am I missing? It works. Remember what we did back there? Don't let the enemy convince you that that didn't happen. So in the process, something is left in the presence and something comes out. Isn't that so cool that we sang graves into gardens? I was just like, yeah. You turn graves into gardens. You turn the seas into highways. Yeah. I love that song. We're probably gonna do it next week, spoiler alert, because I love it. Okay. <laughs> I really do. Let's keep going. You know why I love it? Because I've lived it. And it's truth to me. And I have learned that there's nothing better than him. I know it. Okay, the outcome or the memorial. So we've gone, we've faced the pain, 
We've let the Lord lead us through that river. We've left the stones there and we're on the other side. I understand this is, maybe you're like, well, this is nice. There's rivers and pictures and the Israelites are going through, but what does that mean? I'm a prophetic artist. It can be a terrible combo sometimes. I'd be like, oh, I just saw the wind and there was a cat riding on the wind and it can be super confusing. So in its simplest form, you must go, sorry, I couldn't think of a weird thing, but they come, a <laughs> cat on the wind. That's all you're gonna get from my sermon. You're like, yeah, no, that was great. So funny when you said cat on the wind. Really, maybe it'll speak to you. God does stuff like that. He does, and cats are awesome, by the way. Bunny trail, except when they shed. Okay, sorry. Jody, I'm not gonna go there. Let's give Mel the mic. <laughs> I'll take more water. The memorial. Earlier, I grazed over some areas of pain in my life. I built up my pain resume for you, just so that I can preach to you, and you're like, okay, I'll listen. Can I tell you where I'm at now? Not to brag, but to give you hope. Anxiety and depression are so foreign to me, I can smell them a mile away and they are disgusting. I'm free from the obsessive need to please people. You have no idea how pleasing, the, how freeing that was for me to know that my father just loves me so, so much. So you can compliment me and that's fine. I'll take it. Thank you very much. But I don't live for that like at all because every night when I lay my head down, all I'm looking for is you did good kid. I loved when you sang that song. I know it was hard for you to get up and preach about pain but you did it and I'm so proud of you. And that's all I'm after, it's all I'm after. The, the Lord used the pain of betrayal to heal me in the deepest places of my heart and my soul. He picked up all the broken pieces and put them back together. But let me clear something up. He didn't actually pick up all of the pieces. Yikes, I was broken really, really broken. So if I remove myself from the, the, the scene, I can almost picture him putting me back together. And I'm like, um, what about those pieces? He never put them back in. He put, put me back together better than before. And even stuff that I didn't think I needed healing from, some of the things that we say are, oh, that's just my personality. I've always been like that. I always do that. I've always struggled with that. It's just who I am. Uh-uh. No way, man. So the Lord put me back together in a better way and left a pile of pieces that I didn't need. This is so funny because I'm going to share a picture with you. Kelly, my husband, is so cool. He's so much cooler than I am. He does custom motorbikes. It's incredible. Very cool. Very hot. Ooh. <laughs> Um, he makes things look amazing. And he had this one, he ha just finished this one project and he's like, Mel, come in here, come in here. And he shows me this beautiful work that he's done. Everything's just perfect. Man, if I could ride a bike, I'd be on that thing. Well, I can't. And then he says, come and look at this though. And he shows me this big pile of parts on the other side of this beautiful bike. And I'm like, um, what's all that? Those are the not needed parts. I'm like, what? I don't know if I want you to go riding on this actually, if I'm honest, <laughs> but the parts aren't needed. They're, you know, they regulate speed or they weigh it down or whatever, but he's got this machine so light and trim and fast and amazing. And those other things weren't needed. So when we talk about picking up the pieces and putting me back together, it sounds like such a good thing unless the pieces don't need to be put back. Okay, I have seen with my own eyes, family members delivered from addictions and generational curses. 
I have seen the Lord do what we sang about this morning, taking what the enemy meant for evil and turning it for good. I have seen it with my own eyes. The Lord has set me up with friends who know me, treasure me, and value me no matter where I'm at. It's a beautiful thing. And I have a roar of praise that is purer now than it's ever been because I know who my everything is. I really, really do. He's been with me through it all and I know he'll keep, he, that's his track record. That's my girl, I'm going with her anywhere. Well, I'm going with him anywhere. That's the way I should have put it. He's walked me through the sea and I know he'll keep walking with me because there will be another one to cross. There's always gonna be another thing to face, but I know how good he is. You can't tell me he's not good. I will tell you a million ways he is good. So Joshua and the Israelites, everyone is across, the priests have come out with the ark and the waters are flowing again. So remember this, if you get one thing this morning, write this down, all my note takers in the house. He's the first one in and the last one out. You can take that to the bank. He is not, you know what I've learned in my process? He's not in a hurry when I am because I'm the type of person that really likes to get my stuff together quickly and move on. I don't wanna feel the stuff. And the Lord's like, hold on, you little racehorse. I'm serious, I'm like, whoa, Nelly. Let's rein that in. <laughs> Sorry, Pam. <gasps> Slow down. Like, if you want to go long and you don't want to, you know, burn out two miles down the track, let's get rid of some of this extra stuff. So he's the first one in and the last one out. Let's, let's finish off this story in Joshua. Four, Joshua 4, verse 18 to 24. It came to pass... When the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord had come from the middle of the Jordan and the soles of the priests' feet touched the dry land, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel saying this, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. That all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So Joshua sets up these stones. This time it's a different kind of memorial. It's not a, a monument to pain. It's not a life lived through that filter of shame. It's not even the laying down of the stuff. This is a, everyone come and look and see how good my God is. Look what he did for me. It's a testimony of the mighty, powerful hand of God. When your kids see these rocks, tell them what God has done. Can I just say this, parents, if there's something you are waiting to walk through, you don't have time and I had a choice to make in the middle of my facing the river. If I was gonna give up or if I was gonna let the Lord lead me through. Do you wanna know what sealed the deal for me that I'm gonna do whatever it takes for the Lord to heal me? It was my kids. Parents, can I tell you, you don't have time to wait. You don't have time to wallow anymore, I'm sorry. You don't have time to soothe, soothe the depression, soothe the anxiety, self-soothe yourself into a, a pit where you're almost useless for your kids. You don't have time anymore. I'm sorry. We said earlier that pain that isn't transformed is transmitted, but... Here's the big but. <laughs> Pain that is transformed and healed in the presence of God becomes fruitful for you and prophecy for others. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. Your pain will either be fruitful or become a filter. God, please let it be fruitful. 
so that we can say like Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God used it for good. Don't you want that to be the testimony? The word says in Revelation 12 that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Here's another one, 1 Corinthians, nope, 2 Corinthians 1, verse three to four. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. See, it's for a purpose. It's for a memorial that, you know what, I went through that too. You're going to make it. I know you're going to make it. And our kids need to know that they can make it. The world is crazy. And if I can't walk through the painful places of my life that the Lord asks me to and process that and bring them to him and show my kids that you actually can walk free. We said before, even with the young adults, like the war is on for our kids. There is so much against them. The world needs a healed and free you. The world is watching, and if not the world, the people in your home certainly are, in your workplace, in your social circles. The hurting and the broken are waiting for the hope of your testimony. Your family needs you, your marriage needs you, the river might look wild, but you must go through with the Lord. Your pain is an invitation to discover more of who God is and just how free you could be. There's so much for you on the other side of your pain, unforgiveness, bitterness, addiction, shame, wounds, whatever it is. There's so much. All you have to do is say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to be led by you. Psalm 23 is just a beautiful reminder, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and even in that laying down of the letting the stones go, that can feel like a death. Kind of a death of who I thought I was. You know, maybe you had your career all lined up and it just is gone. Let's leave that stone there too. So we're gonna do something really practical. It's not weird, I promise you. God is so amazing that he can open up healing in a minute in a second. You say yes, he can do it miraculously. And I'm believing for a couple open miraculous doors this morning. Maybe it's even just for one person, but I'm going to be obedient and just follow me, okay? What the Lord told me was that there are people here today who can't even imagine facing the pain in the inside because they are waiting for justice, vindication, and an apology. You don't have time to wait. You don't have time to wait on someone else for your healing. It's time to cross the river and you can't carry these things any longer. So we're gonna go there this morning and what I'm gonna do for you is what the Lord asked me to do. And wherever you're at, I think you probably already know who you are. I'm gonna intercede on your behalf today and I'm gonna offer you an apology. I'm gonna offer you a sorry. Now intercession is so crazy. But simple, the Lord puts a burden on your heart and he's doing it right now for somebody, a problem, a people group. And he says, I need somebody to stand in the gap for this. So you say, okay, I will. So you do it and you're obedient. And then you step out and it's done and you carry on. Oftentimes I'll be sobbing and heavy in intercession. And it's once it's done, okay, Lord, seal it. I'm done and I'm out. Yay. So I'm going to do it quick today. Whoever you are, I've got a couple the Lord highlighted, but if I don't say it, you're still in the mix. I promise you, the Lord knows your situation. The story that you're waiting for, and some of you, it's not even possible to get it because maybe the person has even died, and you're hanging on to that pain. The dad who left, the mom who wasn't what you needed her to be, the person who didn't understand you, the person who hurt you. You were put in a situation you never should have been put in. Somebody abused you. 
Somebody betrayed you. Somebody didn't notice you. Somebody slandered you. Somebody said horrible things about you. So whatever it is today, I'm going to read some and I'm going to say sorry. So for the one whose dad left or died or abandoned you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> to the one who never had the mom and you didn't learn what you should have learned, I'm sorry. the little one who saw things way too early. You never should have seen them. I'm so sorry. I see somebody being hurt in horrible ways so young and it's not right. But here's from the Lord. I'm so, so sorry. the one who wasn't seen. You spent your life feeling like nobody even saw you. Like you're an island. You can be in a room, but you're so alone. I see you, says the Lord. I always have. There may as well be a spotlight on your head. I see you. To the one who was betrayed, Trust was broken and nothing healed. It's a festering wound. I'm so, so sorry. I'm sorry for the pain. I'm sorry for the injustice. Whatever it is, I want you to hear that today. The abuse. was not my plan. I'm so sorry. If I missed you, you receive the sorry of the, of the person. You can even put that, if you want to, if, it, if that helps you put that person's face in your mind and hear the sorry. And Lord, I pray that you would seal that up and open up the door to healing this morning. In Jesus' name. Okay, and we're going to carry on. But that's how much the Lord cares. I thought, you know what, nah, that's kind of weird. I'm not going to do that. But you know what? I preached it to my family. And the Lord gave me a word for my husband. Just like Joshua led the Israelites across the Jordan, hundreds of years later, Somebody greater stepped into those waters too. He would be baptized, showing us again that there's some things that just got to stay in the river. This man was Jesus, and he wasn't just the deliverer of Israel. He's the deliverer of every generation that there ever was or ever will be, including you. He faced every imaginable pain to give you this prophetic promise. With him, you're going to come through too. You're going to overcome too. Isn't that powerful? I'm going to have the worship team come, and I'm going to read you as they come and start playing a poem I wrote, because I'm a writer. And I wrote this as God was showing me how creative he is in his way of healing us. So I'll wait till they start flowing in the background and then I'll ask you to close your eyes and listen. And just imagine what a healed you could look like. Okay? What a whole you could look like. This is called a new kind of warrior. So if you will, close your eyes and I'll, I'll read it to you. This is what he's done for me. He keeps showing me his faithfulness. Each event and trial, every high and every bitter low, 
woven together into a beautiful mosaic of his goodness. The things that shouldn't have healed are healed. They're woven into a mismatched, colorful tapestry of his faithful and steady love. His creativity and redemption have made something miraculously beautiful and sacred. Gold thread on each seam, I'll wear it like a hero's cape, a daughter's dress, a lover's covering, and a bride's veil. I was so broken beyond any feasible repair, but impossible seems to be the place where you dwell. Hurts and wounds from a whole life, you pulled them out of the cracks until no infection could brew inside. And with gold refined in the fire of your love, you filled every crack and joined together all the needed parts. Now I'm glowing from the inside out, the seams of gold shining, letting your glory out. A warrior better than before, standing on the other side of the shore. You are here too, pointing to the beauty of this new land, a land flowing with milk and honey. What a sight, a different kind of celebration, a different memorial, a different kind of strength. A warrior put together, with seams of gold wearing a cape, mismatched patches woven together. His faithfulness is what I'll wear. The glory of his healing and my scars is what I'll share. I'm proud to walk with this reminder of how faithful, steady, near, and kind is my Father. Everyone come and look and see what a redemptive God is he. There's no pain too deep or sin too dark, nothing too broken or too far gone. If he did it in me, he'll do it in you. This faithful friend of mine is here for you too. And I'm gonna prophesy this over you. But before I do, I'm gonna offer an invitation Maybe there's somebody here that doesn't even know the healer, doesn't even know Jesus. And I wanna go there first. If you don't know Jesus, he is the most wonderful, amazing person, savior, healer. And all you have to do is believe, invite him in, say yes to him, and he will come in. And I promise you, it changes everything. So if that's you, I'm gonna get you to come up to the altar as well. We're gonna have the prayer team up here if you need to give your life to Jesus. And then the other thing I'm gonna ask while we worship this, this song is if you wanna start the process with the Lord. This is between you and Him. Maybe you wanna to come to the altar and leave some stones. The Lord's gonna show you, the Lord's gonna lead you. It's not as scary as you think. And that's a word from the Lord. It's not as scary as you think. So as we worship, we're just gonna worship something a little bit, not too crazy. So, so you can come during the song to the altar, which is the front and just take a minute with the Lord. And maybe you feel like you're like right in the middle of that river. So if you need to drop some stones, you can do that this morning too. Now the other thing is, is in that place, the Lord might show you something real practical. Like maybe the stones are a little bit too heavy for you to pull out on your own. That's okay. There are people, there are spirit-filled pastors in our house that can help you. And let me just remind you too, it is wise to ask for help, it is not weak. So if the Lord says, you know what? You need a pastor or a spirit-filled counselor to help you walk this one. Just be obedient and do it because he's inviting you into healing. So I'm gonna prophesy this over you and pray I'm gonna release you if you need to be released to go. We're gonna continue and worship. Come, come to the front if you need to and respond between you and the Lord. If you wanna give your life to this healer, I'm living proof. It'll be the best decision 
of your life. Then come up and we have people that can lead you through that and pray with you. But let me prophesy Isaiah 55, 12 to 13 over you this morning. You will go out from exile with joy and you will be led forth by the Lord himself with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth in shouts of joy before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress tree will grow. And instead of the nettle, the myrtle tree will grow and it will be a memorial to the Lord, an everlasting sign of his mercy, which will not be cut off from you in Jesus name. Do you receive that this morning? So Father, we thank you for your invitation this morning. Thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the comfort. Thank you that your word says you are the God of all comfort. So Lord, right now, I pray that you would begin to move upon the hearts of your people in any area where you are inviting them to come into your presence, leave some things behind and come out as a testimony of your healing power. God, I thank you that you never leave us where you find us, but you lead us and you stay with us in the process. You said you are near the brokenhearted. How precious and wonderful to experience the nearness of you, God. And I pray that everybody in this room, whether they come up and hash it out with you, whether they need to give their life to you, Jesus, or they just walk out the door, I pray and I declare that you will feel the nearness of your God. And Lord, as we go from this place, we go trusting that you're leading us to a new land. And you want us lighter and fit and able to carry the weight of your glory. So God, I bless this people in Jesus' name. I thank you for your presence that never leaves us or forsakes us. We cling to you and all you are. In Jesus' name, amen.